In England on September 22, 1921, a patent was issued to a G. Benny. It had the following description. Suspended vehicles. An aircraft is accommodated between a pair of rigid tracks by bogies and guide wheels. The vehicle may be reversible and may have lifting planes arranged longitudinally and adapted during travel to bear the weight of whole or part of the car. Separate propellers are provided, one being stopped and the other started to stop the car. This strange sounding vehicle described in the patent would be known as the Benny Railplane. It was a form of rail transport that was both inspired, revolutionary and perhaps a little too ahead of its time. The story of the rail plane starts and ends with its creator, and the two are intertwined. To talk about one involves the other. The inventor of the Benny rail plane was a certain George Benny, born in 1891 in Old House, south of the River Clyde, in what is known as today a suburb of Glasgow. Benny, the son of an engineer, was always something of a dreamer and loved gadgets and machines growing up. He had a particular passion for trains, although, as the name of his invention suggests, it was an aeroplane technology that would make the railplane unique. Benny had decided by 1920 that trains would move more efficiently and faster if they were electrically powered and used propellers instead of steam from coal. Furthermore, he believed strongly that this train should ride above the ground as to not be slowed down or hindered by other traffic. And so he commits development of his plane on rails in 1921. However, there was a glitch in his ambition. Benny himself had no formal engineering training. And so he turned to a Mr. Hugh Fraser to be the consultant engineer on the project. Benny was convinced that his invention would free up room for freight traffic on Britain's increasingly congested railway system, which often resulted in delays for commuters. He also argued that his rail plane would be less expensive to operate than conventional trains of the time. And he had some valid points regarding the cost. His rail plane would be built and operate above existing train lines, so there would be no need for land to be purchased for his rail system. There would also be a cost benefit of freeing up existing rail infrastructure exclusively for freight rail, meaning commuter trains would run both quicker and with no delays. It really was a win-win all the way around in Benny's mind. Benny was fortunate enough to come from an affluent family and was able to invest the handsome sum of £150,000 of his own money, which today is a cool £9.8 million or US$13.3 million US dollars today. Benny's belief in his rail plane was unwavering and furious, with massive media blitz to match. He even paid for a Pathé documentary that boasted all about his new invention, which is why today we have such excellent footage. His commitment was total. So what did the Benny railcar actually look like? It was cigar-shaped, reminiscent of a small submarine or a robotic underwater vessel. For its time, it was cutting edge in design and could be described as elegant and streamlined, looking also somewhat like an airship gondola, you know, a smaller, less blimp version of a Heidenberg. The mechanics of the rail car were fairly simple. It ran along the underside of an overhead monorail, very much like monorail seen at airports and amusement resorts today, and had two bogies with wheels, also known as trucks, which you'll remember were referred to in the patent, that were attached to the top rail so the rail car could be held securely in place. Wheels which rested on another rail would be suspended 16 feet above the ground. These wheels helped stabilize the train when in motion. Critically for its design, the rail car would be moved by propellers powered by onboard motors. The Benny rail car had two aircraft propellers, one on each end. The propellers could be reversed, and it was these two aircraft propellers that not only made the train unique in design concept, but also gave it its name. The Railplane. The train also featured a braking system on the top that would hold the train steady at stations. 
The propellers were integral to the braking system as well, as the rail plane would come to a halt when they were reversed. Each car or carriage was designed to carry a maximum of 48 people, although the first and only prototype had seating for far fewer. It was important to Benny that the train not only be comfortable ride, but also luxurious. And so the interior of the prototype was fitted out by master furniture makers and interior decorators Waring and Gillow of London, featuring comfortable seats, stained windows, and plush curtains. But it would take all of his might to make this dream a reality. To create a prototype back in this era, it was rather a challenge for Benny. Parts for the Benny railplane prototype were built at the Darmore Works of William Beardmore and Company Limited in the village of... You know, just pause the production here. There is no way I'm going to be able to pronounce the name of this place. I'm going to give it a go, but please don't hate me in the comments. Ichinan in Refwenshire, to the west of Glasgow. Beardmore and company had been the manufacturers of the R-34 airship, which made sense since the railplane was heavily based on existing aircraft technology. A prototype comprising of an elevated track and a propeller-driven carriage suspended from a monorail was then built on a trial stretch of track. The test track was 130 yards or 119 metres in length along an existing railway in Mingrave, off the Glasgow and Mingrave Junction Railway, and located between Minnelgrave and Hillfoot stations. The development of the prototype of Minnelgrave took place between 1929 and 1930. George Benny's intent was always that his railplane be able to travel at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour or 193 kilometers per hour, astonishing railway speeds for that time. However, the test track at Miller Grave was far too short for the prototype to even attain a smidgen of those phenomenal speeds. Nevertheless, Benny was convinced that his railplane could reach those maximum speeds, meaning that a trip between Glasgow and Edinburgh could be done in about 20 minutes flat. Even today, that trip takes right about 50 minutes by train. But why stop there? If the railplane had been deployed between London and Glasgow, it would have been able to do the trip in about three and a half hours, which in itself is two hours faster than it takes by rail today, almost a hundred years later. It seems for Benny that his idea actually worked and the train of tomorrow was arriving at the station. The prototype Benny Railcar at Minnelgrave was finally opened to the public on July 8, 1930. A test run would be done with journalists and guests on board. Although the prototype didn't exceed 50 miles or 80 kilometers per hour, the test was still heralded as a smashing success. The guests on board loved the experience. One journalist called it a wonderful product of British brains. People were enthused by how smooth and comfortable the rail car felt in motion thanks to its upper and lower tracks. Conventional trains at the time were anything but smooth and quiet. These trains were bumpy and loud, wheezing and shuddering as they trundled past. Not that pleasant. Here was a ride that was luxuriously smooth and oh so quiet. An invited guest on the test run had this to say. The rail plane operated with a perfect smoothness, and passengers only knew that the car was moving by gazing out of the window at the passing landscape. There was no bumping over rails, smoke, or whistles shrieking. A ride in the coach is sheer delight. Right away, the public started to imagine what it would be like to commute all around Britain this revolutionary new train. Imagine what that might have meant for a banker having to commute back and forth between Glasgow and Edinburgh every day. Some of those on board of the test run were almost certainly dreaming of commuter trips like that. Which can only mean that the Benny Railcar was set for success. So if the Railcar really was an absolute game changer, why was it never built? <laughs> Behind the curtain, Benny had been struggling to obtain financial backing needed to properly and fully develop this revolutionary railcar. 
he was unable to secure the financing necessary to build that super line between Glasgow and Edinburgh, nor another proposed one between Southport and Blackpool in northwestern England. But there was some interest down in the south of the country. Several plans were drawn up for a London service, including a route from the city centre out to the new London airport, as well as a passenger line down to Brighton on the south coast of England. One of the London lines was even designed for a London to Paris commute. There were also plans for a line in the south of France. But none of these ever materialised. One investor, Henry Boot, proposed building two new towns at Waltham Abbey and Dangerham so that they could be linked to central London by the Burnie Railplane. That too idea ended up becoming nothing. So why was there never any interest? It should be noted here that the Benny Railplane was technically sound and for all intents and purposes financially feasible. So why did the Benny Railplane fail to raise the needed capital? A logical educated guess would be that the rail transport authorities of the day were simply too scared of a popular rail car that would lose them passengers on commuter lines. In fact, Southern Railways made it quite clear that the company was not pleased with the idea of a potential loss of revenue due to having high speed competitor transport passengers on top of its existing railway lines. This was made abundantly clear in October 1931 when Bernie claimed that he had raised enough money to fund the 20 mile railway line from Holborn in central London down to Croydon Airport. Southern Railways refused access over their railway lines due to the potential loss of revenue from their own service to the airport. Ultimately, the rail plane may have just been too viable for its own good. But our story doesn't actually stop here. There was a little bit of an interesting twist right by the end of our tale. By the mid-1930s, the British government was becoming very interested in the Benny Railplane. Southern Railways had decided to relent and even offered Benny a stretch of a line from London Bridge to Dartford via Lewisham. But Benny refused the offer, standing by his wish to have the line to Croydon Airport instead. One can only imagine what might have been had Benny accepted the original offer of the line from London Bridge to Dartford. Unfortunately, this decision would turn things sour for Benny, and in 1936, he was ousted by the board of the Benny Railway Company, known as the Inter-Counties Limited. Benny was also declared bankrupt the following year in 1937, although this has been disputed by historians. Not to be outdone by being kicked out of his own company, Benny would persevere. He formed two new railway companies in 1946 and 1951 after the war, called the George Benny Airspeed Railway and the George Benny Airspeed Railway Iraq. It was during this time that Benny was also considering a proposed railcar between Baghdad, Damascus, that same proposal would balloon into a colossal monorail line between the River Nile and the Dead Sea in Egypt, which he believed could double as a passenger train and provide irrigation for the desert over which it glided. Imagine that. Unfortunately, these two ambitious plans were also never realised. Distraught, Benny would quit the railway business and go on to run a herbalist shop, the polar opposite of one would expect of a man who once dreamed of high-speed trains in the 1920s. Well, perhaps that makes sense for someone who came up with such outlandish, crazy ideas. As for the prototype sitting at Minigrave, it fell into disrepair and was eventually dismounted and sold for scrap in 1956. Benny would die one year later at a nursing home in Ibsen, alone and allegedly penniless. John Messner, the curator of transport and technology at Riverside Museum in Glasgow, had this to say about Benny and his dream of a high-speed rail car. It never really left him. George Benny was clearly a tenacious dreamer and a man of vision. He was indeed a true son of Scotland, a country renowned for its inventors and innovators. Today, it's easy to look back and see that Benny was clearly right that the future of rail transport involved high-speed technology concepts. By taking the very best ideas from aircraft and applying it to trains, such as aerodynamics and electric engines, one could really see that the train of the future was already waiting with the aeroplane. 
I think that he would be happy to know today, looking down on the world, that many other countries have embraced this idea and created incredibly fast trains like those in Japan and across Europe. For Benny, that was his dream. And it's nice to see that for aviation and train fans alike, that there really was a synergy of technology between the two to bring one man's dream true. Thanks so much for taking the time today to watch this little strange video on what is supposed to be an aviation channel about a train that dreamed it could. One of those mysterious things from history that really required some type of explanation. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity here on the channel to bring to you this part of history. And I couldn't have done it by myself. Special thanks to my Patreons who have taken the time to subscribe to me to support me on this journey. If you'd like to become a Patreon, there is a link down in the description where you can jump on, talk to me directly, vote and suggest future topics, and see videos early where possible. So thank you again so much for watching.